Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. This is the Three Martini Lunch. My name is Greg Knapp. I'm in for Greg Columbus. I'm a speaker, author, coach, talk show host. You can find out more about me, get the links to my social media. It's all at GregoryBnapp.com. That's K-N-A-P-P as in Peter and Peter. I'm joined by Jim Garrity, senior political correspondent of National Review. Follow him on Twitter, at Jim Garrity. Just don't troll him. Huh. <laughs> maybe, right. Or maybe he likes it. I don't know. All right. Uh, Jim, I understand today we have a special. It's a special today. Three crazy martinis for the price of one. Yeah, a lot of days we try to do good, bad, and crazy martinis. Uh, but there are certain days where it's just all crazy, and that just seems like the most accurate way to characterize the developments of the morning. Uh, and, and so in that case, Greg, we can take them in any order you like. You know? Okay, well, when I hear crazy martinis, I'm thinking Democrats must be involved. And sure enough, the town halls on CNN race to the left. We'll start crazy martini one with that. We've got uh, Bernie Sanders and uh, ha- uh, Kamala Harris both mm-hmm. saying not only should felons who have served their time and gotten out of prison vote, which I don't have a problem with that. You serve your time. You did your you did your do d- duty to America, get your right to vote back. They're saying even while they're sitting in prison, whether it be a child molester, a rapist, a murderer, whatever heinous crime, well, they should still be allowed to vote. Yeah, and this came from, they took questions from the audience. It came from a junior at Harvard who gave two specific examples, uh, challenging Sanders on his philosophy that everyone should be allowed to vote no matter what, even if they have a criminal record, even if they're serving time. Uh, one example was rapists, and she said, no, we, this is... We, we elect candidates who are important on women's issues, and you're arguing to restore the vote, or just restore the voting right for rapists, even when they're behind bars. And the other very vivid example she used was the Boston Marathon bomber. Uh, and Sanders gave a long, rambling answer, but the, the upshot was he believes that everyone should be allowed to vote, even people in prison, even people with life sentences like the uh, Boston Marathon bomber. So the upshot is that, yes, Bernie Sanders would restore the vote. They put a similar question to Kamala Harris, the allegedly tough prosecutor from San Francisco, and she said, that's a conversation we should have. Um, right. I, Greg, a little, she's up on stage. That would seem like a good time and place to have that conversation. And yet that was the, some, I think the upshot of her is to say she's not willing to rule it out. Now, I too am willing to have that conversation. My contribution to the conversation is No. <laughs> I like it. About nonviolent offenders, even violent offenders, once they're out. But no, uh, those behind bars should not be casting ballots. Yeah, when I heard Sanders talk about this earlier, he he said, you know, voting is a constitutional right in my state, and therefore they should be allowed to vote even in prison. And, and my contribution to the conversation is, well, voting may be a constitutional right, but so is liberty. And if you violated the law enough that we can take away your liberty then why in the world should you be allowed to vote to shape the laws the rest of us live by while you're sitting in prison? I I can't believe that more than just a a percentage of the far left is on board with this. No, I I, I jokingly said this morning, boy, if you think you're having a difficult morning, imagine being the guy who's in charge of Boston residents for Bernie. Uh, (laughs) I love that. I I can't imagine this is going to be a roaring, roaringly popular uh, proposal in the state of Massachusetts. And, you know, that's... That's what the I was going to say. That's what the Republicans could say in virtually every city. You find the city's worst criminal and say, Bernie, should he vote? And uh oh, yeah, um, you know, look, uh, there's been a broad push towards criminal justice reform over the last couple of years from both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. I think, as you mentioned, there are a lot of people who say, okay, if you did your time, you've served your sentence. Uh, there's a pretty strong argument to say, okay, you are now a fully restored citizen, and your your voting rights should be restored. Florida had a big referendum on this back in 2018. But I think, you know, there's, there's still some divisions over nonviolent offenders versus violent offenders. Some people understandably less enthused about the idea for that. And for folks like this, I mean, you know, if, if you're going to do it for this, it means you're going to restore the voting rights to the Unabomber. Um, based on environmental policies, I assume he's voting Democrat. Uh, Robert Hansen, the notorious uh, FBI official who was spying for the Russians, uh, he worked for the communist government, so I assume he's voting for the Democrats too. Uh, Dylan Roof, the Charlton Church shooter, um, and also Eric Rudolph, who uh, bombed some abortion clinics. Maybe they would balance out on the Republican side. So there you go. Um, I say that with tongue in cheek, and I hope right. I'm offended by that. But the general gist being, 
no, none of these guys should be able to vote. They're, they're in prison for the rest of their lives. So, yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, it's just crazy to me. All right. Well, let's move on to Crazy Martini 2. Elizabeth Warren this time. Now, she wants uh, to make you a sucker if you bother to pay your student loans. Not only is she proposing free college for, well, excuse me, not free college for all, um, paid by other people college for all. Yes. She also wants to forgive all student loan debts in the country and have those be paid by other people. And of course, the other people are the so-called rich. Yeah. Uh, people wonder why Republicans have a tough time winning elections if our ideas are so much better and proven by history and all that. And the answer is we're running against the free ice cream party. Uh, the Democrats are always promising free ice cream and we're saying, no, you have to pay for that. And unsurprisingly, people prefer being told that they can get free ice cream rather than having to pay for it. Well, there's it. no doubt that student loans are, are a great burden on a great number of people. Um, to me, that goes back to the core question of college being so expensive and the fair question of whether colleges and universities are providing students value for their money and if they really are preparing them for the workplace where they can get jobs that will pay enough money so that they can pay back with those loans. Um, the numbers do not come anywhere close to adding up on Elizabeth Warren's uh, proposal. She wants to have what she calls an ultra-millionaire's tax. Not just a millionaire's tax, an ultra-millionaire's tax. It would be about 2%. Uh, of the income for families with a net worth of more than $50 million. No, you do not generate the roughly $600 billion it would take to wipe out everybody's student loans. Um, but then it basically comes to the question of if you paid back your student loans and Elizabeth Warren gets this enacted, well, then you were kind of a fool. <laughs> or, or you should have taken whatever you paid, if you paid part of your tuition at the time and took out the rest in loans, you should have just taken out the biggest loans you could because she's offering to cover up to $50,000. Uh, per person, and that uh, would cover apparently like, you know, 95% uh, of the people who have student loans. Um, basically, you're, you are a, you know, this this is one of those things, it was the same thing when people said, oh, we're going to give mortgage aid uh, back during the bailouts in 2009. Um, when the federal government steps in and says, oh, this is a great burden on people, so we're going to pay for it, it means the people who honored their word, who honored their contracts, who met their obligations, we're suckers for doing the right thing. This is rewarding people who didn't do that. And this is you know, all, the, uh, all the arguments about moral hazard about the bailouts back then. In fact, maybe this is the way that Republicans should talk about this. This is the student loan bailout. Oh, by the way, um, as I wrote in the Today's Morning Jolt, I think the university colleges administrators would look at this proposal uh, and basically uh, react like Meg Ryan in the diner scene when Harry met Sally. Uh, <laughs> this basically would account for the federal government paying for people's college educations forever. Uh, and they'd never have to worry about people defaulting on their loans ever again. And they'd raise the cost even more because one of the things we find drives the increase in costs of college is the more grants and the more loans that are available, the more the cost seems to increase. And so that's not great. And then the other thing that you were just saying, is this also now an incentive for somebody in college or about to go to college thinking, hey, this is going to be free anyway, so I may as well go ahead and rack up my debt because it's only a matter of time till somebody like Elizabeth Warren gets this through. Yeah, and uh, also in today's Morning Jolt newsletter, I kind of took the next natural step. All of the arguments that Elizabeth Warren uses to justify having the federal government pay for people's student loans, it, all the arguments are equally applicable to the having the federal government step in and pay for people's mortgages. Because mortgages are large financial burdens. And this, too, would be a giant middle-class uh, uh, stimulus. And by golly, this would you know, increase equality and make Americans less worried about their finance. Every argument you do for the you know, as I put it, well, what's the point of getting free college education if you can't afford a, a roof over your head when, you know, at the end of the day? That's um, right. People reacting, saying, Jim, that's hilarious. And then they have people saying, Jim, stop giving them ideas. That will be the next thing they will propose. Oh, by the way, that would cost between ten and eleven trillion dollars. With a trillion with a T R, not a B. Yeah, and I don't think we have quite enough ultra rich to pay for any <laughs> of these. And by the way, I want to throw this out at you when it comes to the rich paying their fair share, because I looked this up the other day that according to the Tax Policy Center, the latest data they could kind of compile says for the year of 2018. People who were in the top 0.1%, not 1%, top 0.1%, $3 million a year plus as income, they earned about 7.6% of all the income, and they paid 22% of all the income taxes. 
So we may say there's some ultra billionaires that aren't paying their fair share, but as a group, they're paying like three times their fair share already. Because it sounds fair to me. <laughs> that sounds like their fair share and maybe a little extra. So. Yeah. And, uh, but you, know, you never run out of the ultra rich if you're a Democrat. All right, let's go to crazy martini three. We're bringing in Herman Cain. And by the way, I just have to say up front, I like Herman Cain. I liked his 999. I liked when he was in the debates. I just think he's a nice guy. He's kind of fun to listen to. I think he'd be fun to hang out with. I don't know whether he'd be a great guy at the Fed, but I, I kind of like him. And of course, he has withdrawn from the Fed chair job. And today, Jim, he gave you the real reason what was it. Yeah, uh, looking at the front page of the Wall Street Journal today, um, and it's worth noting, there have been considerable number of, every Democrat was going to vote against him. There were a bunch of Republicans who were less than enthused. I think you could make an argument there was a point in Herman Cain's life when he would be a, uh, not even all that controversial choice uh, for the Federal Reserve Board. Um, he had previously served on one of the regional boards, successful businessman. Uh, but look, ever since the presidential race, he had faced the sexual harassment allegations, um, and also, I think he kind of, you know, as he became Herman Cain, the celebrity, Herman Cain, the brand, uh, had rented out his mailing list to some companies that aren't particularly savory and things like that. Um, but so today, three weeks after the nomination, he announces in an interview with the Wall Street Journal, it's an honor, it's prestigious, and I really wanted to do it emotionally. But factually, it is a big cut in pay, he said, referring to the $183,000 that is an annual salary of a Fed governor. Now, I, I suppose that's a perfectly reasonable explanation. Everybody gets to save face. He's not admitting that he probably wouldn't win confirmation. Everybody gets to be relieved and go home. Greg, my first thought, though, is just it's kind of unfortunate nobody bothered to mention him the salary some, at, any, at any point in the past three weeks. Yeah, it just kind of came out of nowhere that, and that he would have to give up some of the things that he makes money on now, like speaking engagements. And I mean, uh, maybe this isn't exactly the whole story. That, that's either a cover story or a way too honest answer. You know, <laughs> I make way more money in speaking fees. Why would I want to do that? Uh, <laughs> well, that should have been the initial well, answer, here's right? Here's my, uh, my, my molecule of sympathy for Herman Cain. I don't know how things have, have worked in radio world. My sense is that you probably have had this kind of similar experience. Somebody wants to hire you for a job. They sound interested. You go in, you have the friendly lunch. You go in, you have the interview. Things are looking good. And at some point, fairly late in the process, like, okay, let's time to talk salary. And the number they put on the table is like half what you're currently making. Yep. You're like, well, wait a second. I, I was thinking, you know, you, you were saying number X. I was really hoping more like number Y. And they're like, oh, wow, Y is way more than we expected. And you realize if you'd mentioned that in the beginning of this process, you could have saved it once in time. Uh, so maybe that's what happened here. Maybe maybe they really didn't mention to Herman Cain how much uh, – or maybe Mrs. Kane looked at the family finances and said, whoa, 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 we can't take that. Thing. So I, I suppose it's a possible explanation. Um, I think, you know, he can go back and, and be happily being Herman Kane, the celebrity, and his speaking fees and doing all the things that he's enjoying. Republicans don't have to take a tough vote. And, uh, of course, now Trump has to find a new nominee. But uh, yeah, I'm sure that, that he can find someone. Of, and and of you know, quality, not controversial. Jim, one last thing on this that I found interesting as I was reading this morning is that another woman came forward on Herman Cain who said she was willing to testify about a consensual affair she had with him and even describe body parts of his to prove it. And I, I was like, wait a second. I understand the sexual harassment stuff, yeah. but a consensual affair. Wait, where are we going? And what is is this going to be the new standard? Greg, you and I have been around for quite some time. Uh, wasn't the argument during the Clinton impeachment, this is between Bill and Hillary and nobody else's business but their own? And, you know, exactly. I, you know, oh, oh, now, you know, like here's, like, here's if, if you think Herman Cain would be a bad uh, member of the Board of Governors of, of the Federal Reserve, fine. You, you could, let's have that argument. I know some folks are not enamored of being closer to the gold standard. Um, there's a Wall Street Journal editorial that says that one of the reasons Kane encountered such, such skepticism is Trump's uh, criticism and, and kind of you know, very public attacks on the Federal Reserve Board. So um, the, the fear is that Kane is perceived as a would be perceived as a, as a yes man for whatever policies the White House wanted at any given moment. The point of the Federal Reserve Board is to make the best decisions for the economy, whether or not it's popular at that time. So you can have those arguments on the merits, on the policies, on the philosophies of Herman Kane. That's fine. 
Well, once you're, you're bringing in this stuff, you're just throwing everything in the kitchen. It's the old spaghetti cooking uh, strategy. You throw it up against the wall and you see what's there. I agree. And I'm wondering if that's going to happen to Joe Biden from Democrats as this moves forward a little bit, if he ever does get his foot totally in the pool. We'll see. That was Crazy Martini number three. My name is Greg Knapp, and this is the last day I will be doing it before the real Greg. Greg Columbus comes back with Jim Garrity. Thanks so much for being with us on the Three Martini Lunch.